Is it really possible that eating too little can cause you to gain weight? So this is a big question, right? We all know that people who go through weight loss programs, some version of eat less, exercise more, results in weight loss, right? Caloric deficit is going to result in weight loss, and that's usually a goal people want to achieve. And if they can muster up the willpower to reduce their calories and they do it long enough, their appetite might actually decrease and they can have a long sustained run at losing weight. Maybe that'll last three, four, or five, six months. Some people can do it for even a lot longer than that. But one thing we know is that 99% of the time, virtually 100% of the people who lose weight using that method are going to gain it all back and, and then some. And there's different reasons for this and figuring out why that is the case has been a goal of mine or a passion of mine for quite some time. So let me just share with you what my experience has been because I've been working with patients for 25 years and I've gone through every iteration of what's recommended in order to to improve your health and for some of those people improving their health meant to lose weight and I want to share with you what I believe works in the long term not only for my patients but what has worked for me in the long term so one of the things we find you know if you remember the show The Biggest Loser in The Biggest Loser again that's a great study right because that show I think ran for like 12 years and virtually a hundred percent of the contestants not just the winners a hundred percent of the contestants who lost an incredible amount of weight improved their health got off of their medications all the great things happened they all gain their weight back. And the immediate thing that you think of is, well, they got bad genetics. You know, they're just meant to be overweight and that's it. And as soon as they let go of the gas, they go back to the way things were. And that's not necessarily true. You know, so the way the show worked was they would send you, you know, to a hotel. You would probably eat like 600 calories a day. You would work out like six hours a day, work with a personal trainer. They became celebrities. And it was basically a race to the bottom, right? You would lose half of your body weight and the show would choose a winner for each season. But they all gain their weight back. Now, when they left the show, when the show was over and they're no longer in the protected environment of the 600 calories a day, living in a hotel and working out six hours a day, and I'm, I'm just kind of exaggerating there. That seems to be what it was some version of that that they, they were doing. They went back with a plan. They went back with, you know, a gym membership and they went back to their real life. They got back to their jobs. They got back to their environment, but they had a, a plan to go to the gym. They had a plan to eat X number of calories to maintain the weight that they've lost. So let's just say you were eating eating 4,000 calories a day and you were 350 pounds and then you went through this program, you lost all the weight, you got your health back, everything's wonderful. Now, okay, how do we sustain that? Let's do the math calculation. Let's find out how many calories do you need to eat a day in order to just maintain where you're at. And let's just say that number was 2,700 calories a day instead of the 4,000 that got you to being 350 pounds. These contestants would do that. They would follow the directions. And what happened was they started to gain weight and gain weight. And it became incredibly frustrating because they're following the directions. They're not, you know, people who just went right back to scarfing down pizza and, and junk food. They didn't want to lose what they've gained and they just kept gaining weight. So we know that the basic mechanism for that is if your body suspects it's being underfed, it's going to slow down your metabolism in order to prevent catabolism, breaking body tissue down. And what happens is that 2,700 calories becomes, you know, because your resting metabolic rate went down, that becomes of weight gain. All right, so we know how that works. What can we do about it? Well, we don't want to sit here and say a calorie is a calorie is a calorie because we know that that's not true. To say that there are three types of food, carbohydrates, protein, and fat, and that they're just, you know, it's just a math calculation of how many calories they are implies that they're all the same and it's not true. They activate different hormones and enzymes and different activities within the body, but they also have different functions. So for example, if we look at all food as being fuel that can be counted as energy, kind of like gasoline being put into your car, whether that gasoline is regular gas, diesel, or alcohol, <laughs> it's making the assumption that all three different types are exactly the same and they're not. So when it comes to looking at food as fuel, the only one of the three types of food that qualifies are carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are basically fuel. Your body's not made of carbohydrates. You don't use carbohydrates 
for the structure of your body. You can hold on to a certain amount of carbohydrates and store it as a fuel source, but there are no sugars that make up your body, your body composition, again, in a meaningful way. So the other two forms of food can be used both as fuel and as structure. So protein is fuel, but it's also structure, right? Your muscles are protein, your bones are protein, your, all of the enzymes are made from proteins. Everything that is the structure of your body has a protein component, and of course, all of your cell membranes and all of the uh, membranes of the organelles within your cells have fat as their component, right? So that's super important. So fat can be energy and structure. Protein can be energy and structure. Carbohydrates can be energy. Now, carbohydrates can also be fiber. Fiber is kind of like a fuel that you just can't use. You just feed it to the bacteria in your gut. They utilize it and you get rid of the rest. It kind of passes through. Mammals don't digest fiber. So that's one form of carbohydrate which is why we have this belief that vegetables are low carb. <laughs> Vegetables are all carb. They're not low carb, they're all carb. But because so much of it is locked away in indigestible fiber, which we then can give to the bacteria in our gut and they can process it, but we can't. We say that vegetables are low carb because much of the carb is unusable to us as mammals or as humans. Therefore, we can eat more fibrous food without the consequences of consuming all of that carbohydrate. The way we really can't get away as much with eating fruit, fruit has less fiber, has fiber, has less fiber than vegetables do. So if we were to eat too much fruit or worse, drink fruit juice where the fiber is removed, well then all of that carbohydrate gets into our system and causes much of the same problems that refined carbohydrates or junk food, the kind of problems that those types of foods will give us. So how does this go to the story uh, we were telling about gaining the weight after you've lost weight? Well, catabolism, the body breaking down, is when, you know, think about it. When you lose weight, we know that you're not just losing body fat. We know you're also losing muscle, right? And we would like to mitigate the muscle loss, especially if you're over the age of 35, you don't want to lose muscle you would like to maintain your muscle while you lose your body fat. So losing weight fast usually means you're not only losing fat, but you're also losing probably a significant amount of muscle. Whereas there are slower mechanisms for weight loss where you can preserve muscle and we'll talk about that. One of the ways to preserve muscle is to kick in the ketogenic system or put your body into ketosis, which is a way of manufacturing fuel from your body fat that does not get converted into sugar. And when you're in ketosis, it actually has a muscle sparing component to it. The physiology of ketosis actually helps you preserve as much of your muscle, which is why it's great for people suffering from cancer and getting treatment for cancer because you know the decline we get from cancer happens very rapidly when people lose their muscle. We call that cachexia, just a dramatic rapid muscle loss. All right, so with that being said, catabolism, breaking down of muscle or protein, I should say, we can see the muscle get smaller. We don't see our bones get thinner. And the biggest storehouse of protein in your body is your bones, the collagen that makes up the scaffolding that the calcium sits upon within your bones. So when you're losing a bunch of weight and you're over the age of 35 or 40, and in addition to losing body fat, you're losing muscle, you're also losing bone. Don't forget that, especially you women out there who are concerned about osteoporosis. We think that, oh my goodness, I better eat more calcium and prevent bone loss. No, <laughs> the calcium is being lost because the protein on which the scaffolding on which that calcium sits is disintegrating because of catabolism breaking down your body tissue. So to protect you from that, you slow down your resting metabolic rate. This is why thyroid hormone, T3 in particular, the active form of thyroid hormone actually goes down when you're fasting, when you're catabolic. So when your T3 or your thyroid hormone goes down, well, again, that is a downturn in your metabolic rate. So this is important to understand because if you're just reducing calories and you think all calories are the same and you reduce carbohydrates, protein, and fat, you're reducing the protein and fat that you need to maintain your bones and your muscles and therefore you become catabolic, your resting metabolic rate goes down and all of a sudden 2,700 calories results in you gaining weight. And it's not like you're gaining muscle. I mean, yes, if you're lifting weights and doing the things that stimulate muscle, fine. But for the most part, you'll probably be putting on more fat. 
And again, it becomes a vicious cycle because now you're going with the aging process. You're losing muscle, you're losing bone, you're gaining fat, and it is a vicious kind of a cycle. Now, in addition to that, people who lose weight very rapidly and lose muscle, they can wind up with musculoskeletal injuries because all of a sudden now you had all of this muscle surrounding your spine. You bend down to uh, take out the waste paper basket or tie your shoes, and your own body weight bending over actually causes the muscles in your spine to give, and that can cause an injury not only to the muscles but to the discs. It's very common that people who lose weight will can wind up with a disc herniation, a spinal injury. So this is very important to think about because it becomes this weight loss pursuit that we have can result in a rapid aging process and setting you up for injury. Okay, so what's a good strategy against this? The best strategy is if you want to lose weight to take the three types of food that you're consuming and reduce one of them dramatically. Keep the other two at a much higher level. So keeping your protein and fat, and protein typically comes with fat, right? You know, if you eat a steak, there's fat in the steak. If you eat fish, there's fat with the fish. Protein and fat are usually together, especially if you have a paleo style diet. Now, I'm not a promoter of a vegan diet, especially for people over the age of 40, because, well, there's not enough protein. And if you are getting enough protein, and you can be on a vegan diet and get enough protein, that's certainly true, especially if you supplement, but again, when you supplement, you wind up drinking protein, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, and it doesn't come with the fat in a natural way. All right, if you are to get enough protein on a vegan diet, and with that protein typically comes a boatload of carbohydrate, if you're good at dealing with excess carbohydrate, meaning you're not type 2 diabetic, pre-diabetic, insulin resistant, and you're fasting glucose and your triglycerides, and all of those things are where they should be, you can certainly be a vegan and get enough protein, especially if you were to supplement. But again, it's a much more more difficult thing to do, especially for people who have had challenges with, with weight gain because a very high carbohydrate diet is going to support or bring you back towards that weight gain because again, there are more calories coming in. And if there's a lot of fiber, which there should be if you're a vegetable-tarian, right? We don't want you to be a grain-tarian. You need, you know, part of being a vegetarian is vegetables. And if you're not breaking down the fiber and consuming all that carbohydrate, that can be protective. But you just got to make sure you got a healthy enough gut that it's not causing excessive bacterial overgrowth, which can cause gas, bloating, etc. All of these symptoms associated with irritable bowel syndrome, which can happen with too much fiber. Okay, if you're not vegan and you choose healthy paleo style diet with healthy meats, some vegetables and nuts and seeds, etc. And you have a good balance of protein and fat and incredibly low carbohydrate. Then what you're doing is you're signaling to your body, you're signaling to your body that you're getting enough protein and fat. Your body has less reason to become catabolic. And if you're very low carbohydrate, you'll go into ketosis and further preserve the muscle. So you can keep your metabolic rate high. You can still have a calorie deficit if you need to continue losing weight. And with the protein and fat, and again, I'm not a fan of the ketogenic diets that have you pour olive oil on top of everything because you're trying to get more fat into the system. I think fat just comes naturally naturally with eating protein. And if you eat healthy versions of that, it shouldn't be a problem at all. But going very low carbohydrate is going to prevent you from going catabolic, and it's going to allow you to have strong bones and strong muscles with a minimum muscle loss. And especially over the age of 40, that's a desired effect. Now, how much protein do you need? Well, you need about 35 to 40 grams of protein per meal to stimulate the body to replace the proteins in your bone and your muscle that need to be replaced very often. So that's 35 to 40 grams of protein per meal. And you got to do that at least twice a day. And if you're over the age of 40, you got to do some resistance exercise. So those things all together will preserve your muscle, prevent catabolism, prevent your metabolic rate from slowing down, and allow you to continue to lose body fat while preserving your muscle and achieving your goals. So hopefully that is helpful to you. But that's the process. That's what we want to do. We can't treat all calories the same. And it's nice that, you know, with carbohydrates, it's four calories per per gram. With protein, is four calories per gram. With fat, it's nine calories per gram. That's the gasoline equivalent, right? If we just use food for
for fuel, right? Well, since some of those calories from protein is going to making up the structure of your body, not all of it goes to energy, and that's good. And since some of the fat that you're eating is going to structure, not just calories, well then that's good too. Whereas all of the carbohydrate is going to be going for fuel. Now, what's interesting about ketones, and this is the, the coolest thing, and you may have seen this in one of my other videos, but ketones are also four calories per gram, right? So this is kind of preserved throughout when, from an energetic standpoint. But here's what's interesting. When you eat carbohydrates and it's four calories per gram, you either have to burn it or you have to store it. You can't get, just get rid of it. You can't just excrete extra sugar through your kidneys. That's a disease process. That'll destroy your kidneys. That's what happens to type 2 diabetics. So you just can't expel the extra sugar. You have to send it to the liver. You have to manufacture fat and store it as fuel in the form of body fat, not the form of sugar. That's why we gain weight. So let's say you're in ketosis and you're making a lot of ketones, but you're sitting at your desk and you're not really burning as many ketones. What's beautiful about ketones is that if you excessively make ketones, you can breathe them out, you can urinate them out, you get rid of the extra calories through your urine and your breath when it comes to moving those calories to ketones as opposed to sugar. And that's awesome because that prevents you from having excessive calories in the form of ketones, whereas excessive calories in the form of carbohydrates become a big problem. Either it becomes a diabetic problem because you can't convert all of that sugar into fat, or you just are really good at converting it into fat and then you just get fatter and fatter. So that is one of the benefits of having a very low carbohydrate diet and being more of a paleo slash carnivorous type of a person in today's world where we have such abundance and excess food available to us. We don't want to store it all. We would like to get rid of a lot of it in the form of energy, but also ketones that can be urinated or expelled through your breath. And since food is certainly ubiquitous, everywhere inexpensive compared to our ancestors, it's worthwhile doing that. Whereas remember in times of old, our ancestors came from a time of lack where there wasn't a whole lot of abundance. If you got carbohydrates and you could store it as body fat, it allowed you to survive through a lean winter. Who has lean winters anymore? Certainly not here in the United States. So this is a great strategy for your health. And I find, again, we live in a very different world from our ancestors. And a lot of people are getting nutrigenomic testing to find out what behaviors they should have based on their genes. Typically, these are genetic SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. Genetic SNPs are not defects. We have to remember that. Genetic SNPs are survived characteristics Characteristics, and there are variances in our population because our populations lived in different climates, different environments, but now we're kind of we can go wherever we want and we're migrating from one place to another. So seeing these SNPs, we can find some variations in lifestyle that we can choose. So for example, the most popular one are the methylation SNPs that we see that people may not do as well consuming synthetic forms of vitamin B9 or folate and therefore they have to be aware of that because they have an MTHFR type of a genetic SNP. But genetic SNPs are there for a reason. They've inferred some kind of survivability to a population. They don't mean that you have defective genes. And I think we're gleaning way too much information from genetics. I think we have to look at our environment and how much our environment has shifted in the last few hundred years. And the fact that we have so much abundance available to us, it's better to look at your lifestyle first, to look at your behavior, to look at your exposure to food, to look at your lab results as it relates to your blood chemistry, a direct window into your daily behaviors before you start looking into your genetic history and trying to determine what the best foods are to eat based on that. I believe that the genetic SNPs have value. I think we're still learning a lot. I think we only have good actionable information on really just a handful. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of genes and we've identified so many SNPs that are related to nutrition and lifestyle, but are we really that knowledgeable about how to manipulate our lifestyle based on those genes? I really don't think so. MTHFR is very well studied. Yes, there's some related to cholesterol and dementia that we can look at that give us valuable information, but I would hazard to guess let's get the more direct biomarkers of our activities, you know, like found in blood or cardiometabolic testing or finding out exactly what your current environment is, what kind of feedback you're getting from that, doing lab tests and then making decisions. And if you're still having challenges or you'd like to improve even more, then you can go into the genetic SNPs, the few maybe dozen or so that I believe are most actionable or worth 
taking a look at. And that would be the topic of another video. So again, thank you for subscribing to this channel. If you haven't subscribed, please hit the subscribe button because we want to make sure that we inform you whenever we put out this kind of information for you to absorb and share with your friends.